gives a shit about Kim Kardashian's ass? But I'll bet even in Australia, you guys are playing this Thank up. You. Yeah, you know? Hey everyone, Giordano here from The Juice Media. Welcome back to The Juice Media Podcast, a companion to the Honest Government ad series. This episode was filmed in Vancouver on the lands of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And it is a companion to our latest Honest Government ad about Canada. A message from the Government of Canada. Canadians have been asking us to make an HGA for them for literally years. I'm glad we finally made it. I hope we did you justice, and I'm sorry that we took so long. The reason it finally came about is that I had the honor earlier this year of being invited to Toronto to speak with a local group of satirists who will be making content about the Canadian government's own climate shit fuckery. While I was there, I had the chance to visit this beautiful part of the world and to meet awesome people doing important work to unfuck it. Those conversations helped me to research and write this honest government ad which focuses on the wet suet and resistance to the coastal gasoline pipeline in northern British Columbia. Thank you to all the Canadians who welcomed this video about their pipeline loving government and friendly horsey police. We'll continue to follow the wet suet and fight against coastal gasoline closely over the coming months so there may be a follow-up. In the meantime you can support them at yinteraccess.com and unistoten.camp. One of the highlights of my visit was in Vancouver, where as well as being able to get legally high, I had the honor of meeting with David Suzuki, one of our greatest scientists, communicators, broadcasters, academics, and environmental activists, and someone who inspired me deeply as a young person when I first heard him talk here in Australia many years ago. So you can imagine how stoked I was that he accepted my invitation to sit down with me for an interview. I also invited David's daughter Severn to join us, a powerful speaker, writer and activist, and who some of you might know from this historic video in which as a 12 year old she famously roasted delegates at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. I am here to speak for all generations to come. Do not forget why you are attending these conferences, who you are doing this for. We are your own children. Many of the questions I asked David and Severn are framed around the similarities between Canada and Australia, both of which are settler colonies, massive fossil fuel exporters, and home to red and blue two-party systems, albeit with oppositely assigned colours. So I intentionally asked them questions which I hoped would help Australians better understand and navigate some of the challenges we face back here at home. From the coming referendum on the Aboriginal voice to Parliament, in which I personally will be voting yes, to climate policy under our new Labour government, and the importance of youth in leading the climate movement. So I hope this interview will have something for Aussie and Canadian audiences alike. A huge thanks to Dan Lone for filming this interview at short notice and props for the brave work he's doing documenting the resistance to the coastal gasoline pipeline up at the Unistoten camp on Wet'suwet and Lands. I hope you enjoy this interview and I'll catch you on the other side. Welcome to the Juice Media Podcast, Seven and David. It's really good to have you here. The podcast is a companion to our Honest Government ad series, which I believe you've seen. It's reached you here in Canada. So very funny, very funny, and, and right on, I think. Yeah, I love them. I have loved them for several years. But why haven't we done any? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they're also, they're not only funny, but they're educational and they're important. But do they have an impact? Well, you know, we've changed governments, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we've played a part of that. For that. I'm right? not all the credit, but definitely I think we've played a part in that. Um, look, most of our audience is Australian, so before we get on to the Canadian government's shitfuckery, which I'm going to ask you about, I just wanted to ask you about Australia, which is a country that you've visited many times and have a strong connection with. One of those times actually was in around 1998 when you gave a public lecture at the University of Western Australia. I was one of the students in that audience. I was 18 years old at the time and you inspired me very deeply. So it, it means a lot to me to be here 25 years later to have this conversation with you. Um, I don't think we'll see you in Australia again because you've recently pledged not to fly. So unless you come by boat, which I don't recommend, this might be the closest many Australians will come to hearing you. Uh, talk. What would you like to say to those Australians um, who are in our audience uh, in the context of the climate emergency and what <laughs> needs to be done? Do you see Australia being able to change its ways now um, after our recent election? I have no idea what the government is that's, uh, that's in now, but I certainly feel, you know, we forget that in 2019 
Australia was on fire. The whole continent was on fire. And that was, I thought, this is going to be the trigger moment when the whole world says, oh my God, you know, this is happening. North America was on fire on the West Coast. But then COVID hit and kind of took all the, uh, all the heat out of that, that whole movement that Greta and the fires had generated. I was shocked at how badly off the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is the last time I dove. Uh, on the reef, I just wept and I said, I'm never coming back here. It's gone. It's dead. And if that isn't enough to, to galvanize Australians to do something, I don't know. I don't know what it'll take. I know that you have a lot of, uh, you have a, a lot of impact of the coal industry. Gina Reinhardt is a very powerful person in your, and you know, and Rupert Murdoch, and you think of those people uh, having a huge impact on the country. Um, I don't know, but I, I certainly, I'm a big fan of, of Mike Rands, who is the Premier of South Australia, and I just got in touch with him re recently, and he told me all of the things that's, that are happening in South Australia. Well, holy cow, that uh, should be an inspiration. Yeah. Um, Australia and Canada are very similar in many respects. We're both settler colonial states, we're both massive petro states, and in both countries, indigenous peoples are on the front lines of defending their lands from oil, coal, and gas, um, which our respective governments would love propping up. Um, there are also some differences. Canada had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Australia skipped the truth part and we just had a reconciliation process. We are, however, having a referendum this year uh, to decide whether we should constitutionally enshrine a voice to Parliament which um, will advise our government on matters that affect Indigenous Australians. Severn, you've dedicated your life to working on climate, uh, environment and with Indigenous peoples in Canada. What lessons can you share with, with Australians at this point in, in history about laying a true path towards justice and reconciliation? And if I might add something, can you also please explain the concept of two-eyed seeing? It is something that I've come across for the first time during this, my trip to Canada this time, and I don't believe we have anything like it in public discourse in Australia, and I really think people in Australia need to hear and learn about this. Okay, so no, uh, no small questions. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I think, first of all, I guess I could speak to two-eyed seeing. I, um, drew on a similar concept quite a bit in my master's research. I did a master's of science in ethnoecology. So I was studying with indigenous elders from the Kwakwakiwak Nation here on the west coast of Canada and studying how they traditionally used, harvested, and managed um, eelgrass, which is a very important ecosystem structural uh, plant that creates a lot of habitat, but also you know, prevents erosion and all these things. So very important for climate change. And it turns out that people actually actively managed it well as they harvested it for food and helped it grow even better than it would on its own. And so I, I, I used science, ecological science, as well as indigenous knowledge, and really drew on these two ways of knowing about the earth and the world around around us. And it seems to me, and it seems to um, a lot of academics and an idea that's gaining currency, that using these two different ways of knowing actually brings, could bring management and our engagement with the world into focus. And so um, this concept has been written about and published as two-eyed seeing, you know, one eye being um, science and uh, modern scientific movement, and then also traditional ecological knowledge and traditional knowledge and practice. And I think it's really brilliant. Um, this framing is attributed to Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall, and um, he is one of the co-writers of the, the paper that um, was published in 2019, 2015 on this subject. But it's been really interesting because it's really gained a lot of currency people um, are talking about this concept to a seeing because it makes sense, right? Like, you know, if we think that all, you know, human culture is about logic and reason and, you know, everything since the industrial age, yes, we are lost. But actually, 
humans have a huge diversity of ways of being in the world, and that is what we have ignored. We, we've just said, oh, no, humans are this, and yet we have all these different indigenous examples all over the planet of another way of being. And in fact, as I was saying about the example of the Kwakwakiwak, actually living to enhance and contribute to ecosystems. I mean, what a concept. <laughs> Humans actually making habitats better as their way of life. And so there's so much promise in learning from indigenous peoples. Indigenous people offer a path through this ecological bottleneck that we find ourselves in. We now know that we are in the, the sixth mass extinction event on planet Earth. And, you know, Western cultures are waking up to this. Oh, my God, you know, we have IPCC reports and all these things giving us this news. Indigenous peoples are like, yeah, no kidding. We've been surviving this for 500 years. We know it's the sixth mass extinction. This is what we've been living through. And guess what? They know how to survive. They've been navigating this. So I think the time is when we're going to be coming to Indigenous people once again, as you know, the colonialists came originally to, um, to the United States, and we're going to be begging for help. We're going to be begging them to help us survive and hoping that you know, they're going to want to take us in again because they actually have a framework for survival. A lot of what you said maps back onto the Australian context very strongly. I want to ask you another question. This is actually for, for, for both of you. Um, I think one time you visited Australia, David, was in 2013, and you, you fronted uh, an audience of climate skeptics on our national um, Q&A oh, show, yeah. um, which I rewatched recently. <laughs> and I was like, oh, gosh, so embarrassing. But, um, but that year was really crucial for Australia. 2013 was the year that our Conservative Party, uh, which we call the shit party, um, took power. Um, that period lasted a decade. It's been a dark decade for climate and many other things, for refugee policy, for so many things, but especially for climate action in Australia. And we only ended that period last year with our election where we kicked out the shit party and elected the shit light party, which is uh, our Labour Party. So in a way, Australia now finds itself at least at the federal level of politics in a similar position to Canada when you kicked out your own shit party, the, the Harper government, and elected your own shit light government, which is led by Justin Trudeau. Question for both of you. Looking back on the past eight years under Trudeau, what lessons can you share with Australia, specifically about climate policy as we enter this period of shit light government? Do you have any advice for us, especially climate activists and um, advocacy groups? How not to be led astray? Do you want to answer that or do you want me to go? I... Well. I think that de Western democracy is in a total crisis. I mean, we're not able to elect and act on the real needs of the people. I mean, what is leadership? Leadership is supposed to be making the tough decisions for the, that are for the best of the whole, of the group that you're representing. And we don't have that. You know, and, and governments, you know, the good guys, the shit light, people get in, and they don't seem to be able to, to be able to do the right thing. So it's an absolute crisis. And when you look at right now the numbers, I mean, you know, we're in a time of, you know, we're getting into recession, people are, the cost of food, the cost of oil, all these things that people need because our system is totally focused and built on now, I say, fossil fuel supremacy culture. Um, and, uh, and yet we are handing over trillions in subsidies, taxpayer dollars, to those two fossil fuel companies. And they are making more money than they ever have before. I mean, last year, I love the quote from Joe Biden. He said, Exxon made more money than God this quarter. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I mean, they are making more money than God. And he's approved the willow uh, And yet, development. he himself is trapped. And so there's this real crisis. And you know, like we can get all mad and like spout and it's fun, but I am now finding inspiration. And this is important because I'm tired. I'm, we're getting tired of like always railing around the failures of the government. Where I'm finding inspiration is in local communities who are saying, I'm not waiting for the federal government to wake up and finally do the right thing. And they're doing it themselves. And they're humble examples, but there are so many of them. And so one example here, you know, 20, 2020, uh, 2021 
We had the, the hottest record-breaking temperatures recorded in the city in Canada, in the town of Lytton here in BC. And two days later, it burned to the ground. The whole town burned to the ground. There is nothing left. And here, even a couple years later, there is nothing. It is just a, a wasteland. The community next door to it is a First Nations community, Kanaka Bar. And they, a couple years earlier, had listened to the, to the scientists. They'd invited the experts in. And then they'd acted. They had put in you know, the proper kind of kinds of culverts to prevent flooding. They um, started a micro hydro run of the river to get off fossil fuels. They started um, actually farming their own food. They have 20% of their own food. They put in you know, their own cell tower for, to, be, to be safe. They started doing all of these things. This is a tiny with their own money. With their own money. And when Lytton, their neighbors, burned to the ground, Kanakabar was you know, as safe as safe can be, one of the safest places in Canada. And this past year, they actually have started building earth homes, these special earth homes, to help their Lytton neighbors return and live a little bit closer to their former homes because the government has done nothing for them. It's still a wasteland. And here, this tiny little First Nation is helping their white neighbors come back and live a little closer. I mean, they're just saying, no, we're going to do it ourselves. And I think that that kind of attitude is something we have forgotten, is that human beings are survivors. How are we three here today? We're here because our ancestors survived all kinds of terrible things to be able to exist here. We did it with community. We did it you know, with collaboration. And these things that eat these practices that we've largely forgot about, forgot about why? Because the capitalist system has broken down relationship and tried to monetize, all, you know, oh, you don't need your neighbors. You just need money and you have these economic interactions. And it's made us unbelievably vulnerable to basically any unforeseen event. And so I'm sorry, but our, our, our government system is really, it's failing us. And so we really have to roll up our sleeves and go back to our roots, which are, we know how to do this. We know how to take care of ourselves. We just have to reinvigorate community and find our resilience again. And there are examples of this all over the planet. So last year, um, my wife and I wrote a play and uh, we were scheduled to uh, do a two week run with this play in Toronto. Well, Toronto's 4,000 miles away. And I said, I'm not going to fly. Uh, we didn't. We have one scheduled train from Vancouver to Toronto a week, and the cost of it now was eighteen thousand dollars for the two of us. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, I said, no, I can't go unless we drive in an electric car. So we took uh, eight days. Normally, it's a, a five-day, four-day trip, and and dropped in along the way and corroborated everything Sev, Sev is saying. All along the way, communities are doing things. I mean, the First Nations group in, uh, in Alberta that has bought a herd of 40 buffalo, because they're bison people, they're bringing back the bison to roam in their territory. And to rehabilitate the land, because and the land actually needs bison to be productive. And the Cowasis uh, uh, tribe in uh, Saskatchewan, I think, has the largest uh, uh, solar farm in, uh, in uh, Saskatchewan. We went to uh, the Henvey Inlet uh, gang in, Ontar in Ontario, the largest um, wind, wind uh, turbine. Uh, you know, all kinds of... And City of Regina, the capital of Saskatchewan, is uh, committed to uh, zero emissions for the city by 2035. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things are happening at the local level. The revolution is happening, but it's at that terrible stage of just the beginning when you see the inflection, and uh, we need it going up. So right now, what we need is the big decisions to be made, uh, and, and that is to stop investing in any further uh, fossil fuel infrastructure and get on with reducing our emissions, stop making it, uh, it worse. The terrible thing is our government now is continuing to invest 
in fossil fuel infrastructure. And so we've got a huge investment in what will be sure to be stranded assets. All of these pipelines cannot uh, operate uh, indefinitely into the future. But uh, as well, it's the, the government's pleading, we don't have the money because we're investing in all these fossil fuel infrastructures. And so, um, you know, we have to go back and say, look, uh, look what you did when COVID hit. The government did amazing things. Canadians responded in amazing ways. We took it as an emergency. And then money wasn't the issue. I mean, we were spending not tens of millions, not hundreds of millions, tens of billions of dollars. And I'm going, where the hell did all this money come from? Well, the government just cranked it out. Money isn't the issue. But all of the parties were together and said, look, we've got to do this now. And that's what we need is to accept we're in an emergency, so politics has got to be irrelevant now. We've all got to be working together, and we need big decisions to be made that support what is going on at the local level. It's also very helpful that um, movements like yours to just keep on exposing this ridiculous reality, especially about the money. I mean, the money that seems to be available for, for pipelines is unbelievable. Like, oh, you know, Coastal Gas Link is going to cost an extra billion, $10 billion? Oh, well, like, yeah, that's too bad. Whereas, it's, you know, we can't even fund these, you know, small little renewables because it's going to cost too much. I mean, it's just But it's a very good laughable. point about what they're, they're doing. If you look Keep at the who the down. serious commentators are in North America today, it's Stephen Colbert. It's uh, Noah, what's his name? Trevor Noah. Trevor, Trevor Noah. Noah. You know, it's all, they're all comedians. <laughs> and if you look at, you know, Ukraine, Zelensky was a comedian. <laughs> and I think pointing out the ludicrousness of what these serious politicians and business people are saying, that's really important to, to, to do, I think. Agreed. And unfortunately, I have to go. But I think that there's one other thing I'd like to can say. I, if, if you have to go, can I ask you one, okay, well, a one quick more question? question? Yes. And, and sorry, just to uh, phrase off, I might just have to edit this bit, but um, you know, I, I really hope people in Australia are hearing this because Seven and David and people in Canada are talking to us from the future. We're all in the honeymoon phase of, oh, we've finally gotten a, a better government and everyone's waiting for this government to really act. And um, they're, not, they're funding massive fossil fuel exploration. So we could wait another eight years to see uh, Australia go in a similar direction or we can take on board what we've just heard and actually take action now and often what we talk about is leading from behind to create a mandate for governments to, you know, to feel like they can take bolder action. Um, I wanted to ask you, Seven, from your perspective, the, the legacy that you've created, um, you've dedicated your life to climate and intergenerational justice and when you were only 12 you famously roasted international delegates at the the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio, which is where the UN Treaty on Climate Change was signed and that gave rise to our annual COP summits. And 30 years later, another teenager is now still roasting uh, international delegates at these COP summits. Um, we had Greta on our podcast as a guest recently. Could you talk about how you felt when you, when you saw Greta following in your child self's footsteps and reflect on, yeah, on the legacy of inter intergenerational justice as we now see thousands of students taking to the street and mobilizing for climate action. Yes, well, I have to say I was not the first, you know, there were many uh, youth activists at Rio, and I think that that's a role that young people have played throughout society always, you know, challenging adults to walk their talk, to do what they said, and actually, you know, be the role models that they should be. I think that's a very important role of youth. and. Since myself, there's just been so many youth activists. So I think there's a bit of a, you know, of course, the cult of personality, the difference with myself, um, though not to the scale as Greta, and Greta is, you know, that it was uptaken by the media and went around the world. And so we heard those voices, and that's really, really powerful. Um, but yeah, it fills me with, with pride to see Greta um, and all of the other young people. It also, you know, fills my heart with sorrow as well that we haven't been able to move the dial more um, and, and really change the world more, even though we knew what was on the horizon, you know? So it's, it's very full of emotion. And I think that there's something about 
our energy in this movement and how we engage with it to not get um, too engrossed in the pain and the negative, but also be able to be inspired for the sake of our young people. Because our young people are inheriting our mess, and it is a mess, and yet, and yet there is so much possibility in the same moment for revolution, for transformation, and for actually like leveling up human society. I mean, in order to survive this bottleneck, we have not just got to be more sustainable and not just drive EVs. We've actually got to face our internalized racism that colonization has programmed all of us to be part of. I mean, you know, I talk about fossil fuel supremacy. You know, we capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy culture, these have intersected perfectly to allow for fossil fuels and fossil fuel industries and infrastructure to just take over and dominate society to the point where, you know, we all think, oh, this is the only way life can be. You know, that is fossil fuel supremacy. And in order to dismantle that, we have to look at all of these other aspects of capitalism, like we have to face that. And so the opportunity for transformation is huge, but we have to walk through that fire. And so we are gonna have to summon a way of doing that with empowerment and not just, because you can very easily just say, oh my God, you know, this is so terrible and we haven't done it yet. But we're just, you know, we have to, we're preparing for that moment when we're gonna walk through and we, we, are, we will do it because we have children. We don't actually have a choice. So I think the wrong question, it's not the right question to say, can we do it? It's, no, we have to do it. And so we will. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. I'm it's sorry. been a real honor. Don't forget your yeah. mic. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you, Seven. Thank okay. you for joining us. Yeah. All right, have uh, Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know why you have me now. I mean, <laughs> she's terrific. <laughs> But if I can assume some uh, things, I'd like to develop the, the discussion about democracy earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, we've always kind of, we've hailed democracy as this great achievement, and we live in, a, in a, our countries that elect, you know, that, that anybody who's um, a mature adult can now vote and express their support for various uh, um, programs, depending on what party it is. And so we really pride ourselves on having achieved uh, democracy. The problem that I see is that, uh, that the people most affected by what governments do or do not do now are not the current generation of voters. It's our children, our, our future generations, who are not on the political agenda because they don't vote. For that matter, uh, trees don't vote, or the atmosphere doesn't vote, the fish don't. The, the implications of what governments do reach far beyond just adult voters. Politically, the problem is when a politician today is elected, their highest priority is the next election. And in Australia, that's only three years, mm -hmm. right? Whatever you do, do not do has got to pay off before the next election. Well, we're in a mess. In order to get out of this mess, we have to start things now that are gonna take decades. Politicians can't encompass that. So clearly, I mean, I think our, our system, our democratic system, it really isn't, isn't up to dealing with these big things. What we need, I believe, is a citizen's assembly. Draw names out of a hat and let them govern us. They will have overlapping, you know, six-year terms. Every two years, a third of them are, like, are, are drawn from a hat. And their only job is no loyalty to, to parties or corporations. Their only job for that six-year period is to do the best job of governing this country. Well, that would put us out of business because we do a show called Honest Government Ads, but I would gladly hang up my hat if we had a citizens' assembly. Yeah. So hopefully we can get to that. In, there isn't in, in a chance in hell that that'll ever happen. <laughs> um, you know, you've been talking about um, the pyramid and, and the web, and for the last 
Well, for most of your life, you've been working on helping people to understand that concept. Um, and for the past 44 years, you've hosted Canada's leading documentary series, The Nature of Things. Hello, I'm David Suzuki. Welcome to The Nature of Things. Um, last week, I watched you host the very final episode of that series, um, which will now be co-hosted by your, your other daughter, Suzuki, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. So, First of all, I just wanted to acknowledge the legacy you've created and thank you for engaging and educating so many people around science and, you know, and, and the web that you describe, the web of life, and of course the climate emergency. In a recent interview, however, you were asked if you had any regrets about your approach and you said, I'm very unhappy, I should have been much stronger. Can you reflect on that? How do you feel you could have been stronger? Well, I don't spend my time, you know, regretting, oh, damn, I should have done this or that. So that question came at me and it was, it was asked in the context of, you know, uh, civil disobedience and all of that. So I hadn't really thought about if I could do it over again. Uh, but for that moment, I thought, well, the only thing I can think is that I would have been stronger. I mean, uh, I... I've been blackmailed in many ways. I was prepared to get arrested during the 70s when we were having big battles in British Columbia over the future of forests. And the people at the Nature of Things said, look, if you get arrested, first of all, they'll, the CBC will pull you off the program and probably the program will be canceled. Well, to me, the Nature of Things is the most was and is the most important programming on, uh, on television. It was there for 16 years before I became the host. And so I couldn't threaten this, the future of the, the series. I should have left the series way earlier so that I could be more active. I was reined in as well by virtue of setting up uh, the David Suzuki Foundation, which is a charity. And our charitable uh, requirements are that you not be partisan. You can be political, but it has to talk about the government, but you can't po focus on individuals or parties. And that has really troubled me. That's been a real uh, difficulty that I, if I had an activist uh, other life to live again, I would have been at the front lines screaming at the corporations, the corporate executives and the, the government uh, people that weren't doing enough. Um, I did the best I could, yeah. that's all I can say. <laughs> and, no, and no one ha has any complaints. It's more of like, yeah, a question about your own feelings. Um, mm. And you know, this is just as a follow-up, it's an uncomfortable question to ask, but it has to be asked, how far do people have to go to stop the destruction? of our planet. The Wet'suwet'en nation up in northern uh, BC have tried everything um, peacefully to oppose these pipelines going through their lands. You recently mentioned that if, if we don't do something, people are going to start bombing pipelines, which got you into, into hot water. But if bombing pipelines is too strong and what we're doing isn't strong enough, what is the right approach? What do people have to do? Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Um... <laughs> You know, I've spent a lifetime trying to educate people so that they can make better decisions in their lives. And I, I despair at the, my thought was when I started, my first television series was in 1962. And my whole thing was, look, the most, we're focusing on, if you look in the papers or on television in the 60s, we're focusing on politics, on business, on sports, on celebrity. But none of these is going to affect your lives uh, in anything like the impact of science when applied by industry, medicine, and the military. I watch the war in Ukraine going on now, and it just makes me sick to see the science that has gone into making drones and remote controlled uh, missiles and all of this stuff. Think if that knowledge had been turned towards dealing with the problems we face on, in the biosphere, what we could do. Um, so I, I began my, a career and I was a scientist. Uh, I began my career trying to educate people about the role of science. Today, People in a cell phone 
have access to more information than ever in human history. You can get the entire Library of Congress from the United States with your cell phone. And what's, what's happened? People are not better informed. What they do now is they scroll through the internet till they find something that confirms everything they already believed. You want to think climate science is bullshit? Guess what? There are dozens of websites with PhDs on there saying exactly that. You want to believe God created the world and the universe in seven days? Guess what? Websites all over Flat the earth. place. So yeah, we don't have to change our minds because there is so much information that anybody can get on the internet and uh, it's, it's an absolute mess. So I despair that our great boast as a species is we're smart. We're constantly saying, well, we're smart, no other. Well, Jesus, those damn octopuses, they're smart too. Uh, those crows, holy cow, are they, you know, we've always boasted that we're the smartest guy on the block. Well, we are, we are clever and indeed intelligence was the key to our, our survival. But we're so, We've got, we, when I was a kid, we used to say they're too big for their britches. They think they're too, too smart. And that's where we are now. We've created structures to govern ourselves, our laws, our economies, our politics. But they're all about us. And we've left out the most important foundation of the way that we live. How can you have laws governing the air? governing water or the movement of species. Um, I mean, it's absurd. Nature doesn't give a shit about our laws, but we try to manage everything through legal means. Our economy is based on the creed of cancer, endless growth. Nothing in, this, in the biosphere can grow forever. And it, every scientist I talk to agrees with me. We're already way beyond the carrying capacity of the planet for us. We're way beyond anything that can be sustained into the future through our economy. And uh, Partha Dasgupta, an economist from Britain, last year published a major paper showing the problem with the economy is nature. And all of the things nature does to allow animals like us to live isn't even in the economy. It's an externality. So all the plants taking carbon out of the air and putting oxygen, guess what? Ec economists ignore that. It's got nothing to do with it. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and Mark Carney, who's one of the big economists, he, he ran the Bank of England and then came back to Canada, published a book called Values. And it blew me away reading the first chapter. He said, Amazon, this company Jeff Bezos has created is valued by the economy in the hundreds of billions. Amazon, the greatest ecosystem on the planet, has no value until it's dammed and flooded, until it's burned, until it's mined, until it's logged, until a city is built in it, until humans go in. It has no economic value. Now, if that isn't the definition of madness, if that doesn't tell us the economic system is fucked up, I don't know what else is. And as I've said earlier, our political system is all based on getting reelected and who's going to vote. We've got the best environment minister that we could ever hope for federally now. He used to be with Greenpeace. He was arrested protesting fossil fuels. He knows what it's all about. The minute he was elected as a minister, appointed minister of the environment, he had to say, oh, well, you know, we're, we got a new park and uh, we've got the carbon tax now and uh, all this incremental stuff. Meanwhile, he knows goddamn well those incremental is no longer any good. But that's the problem is we need transformational change and that's revolution. Can we do it without killing people is a question, and obviously we won't. Final thought, because Seven said it's not about if and how, it's we have to make yeah. it work. You've, refer, you've referred to this as, the, as, a human, as, the, as an experiment. The humanity is an experiment. What is, final thought, you know, is this experiment going to make it? We were this magnificent creature, you know. We emerged uh, in the uh, grasslands of Africa 150 to 200,000 years ago. 
And when you look, compare us to all of the other animals that were on the, on the plains of Africa, we weren't very impressive. I mean, there weren't many of us. We weren't big. We weren't very strong. A chimpanzee weighing half our weight would kick the shit out of any one of us. Uh, we weren't fast. We didn't have special senses. You got to go, holy cow, how did that ape do it all? Well, it was intelligence. That was our great gift. And we, I believe that one of the gifts of, of our intelligence was we recognized there's a thing, we invented it called the future. It's, the future doesn't exist. Only, the only thing that's real is now and what we remember from the past. But because we invented the idea of a future, we realized we could affect the future by what we do in the present. You know, you're walking along a path and it branches into two and you go, oh yeah, my mom went down to the right a few months ago and she ran into a saber-toothed tiger. But my uncle went down to the left and he found something good to eat. So I'm going left. Foresight was the great, I think, breakthrough for our species. We could now plan and do things deliberately in the hope that you will have a better future. Well, today we've got all of the uh, amplified ability to look ahead. You know, they're called scientists and engineers and supercomputers. By the way, have you noticed how accurate weather forecasts are now? 50 years ago, it was a joke to hear a weather forecast. Today, they're making, at least in British Columbia, I don't know Melbourne, about Australia. Melbourne, it doesn't work so well, okay. but maybe the rest of the but world. I am astounded. They're making predictions now. Four days from now, there's going to be an atmospheric river, you know, and, and with tremendous accuracy. We've got scientists who for over 40 years, not people like me, over half of all Nobel Prize winners in 1992 signed a document warning to humanity saying we had only a one or a few decades to take the big step. So they've been warning us. In 2019, May of 2019, the United Nations released an absolutely terrifying document that said 50% of species that have gone extinct have gone extinct in the last 40 years. Humans have caused this major extinction, and another million species are now in imminent danger of going extinct. So that was, again, a, anybody that realizes how important nature is for our survival would know this is, this is a crisis. The next day, Harry and Meghan had a baby. So that's what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. We've got these incredible ways of communicating with each other. And it's all on trivia. Who gives a shit about Kim Kardashian's ass? But I'll bet even in Australia, you guys are playing this Front out. Yeah. yeah, you know? And so from my standpoint, at the age I'm at, I've spent all of my life focused on trying to get governments, trying to get corporations to do the right thing. Well, I think that was, that was a misdirection of my activity. That it should be what Severn is saying now. It's, the systems are going to break down. They're going to break down, and that's the reality of what nature is, what's happening with nature. And um, we're, uh, we're going to have to then focus on the unit of survival, which is going to be our local communities. And I think Sev is absolutely right that, on that. And uh, that's going to be where we, if we can be much more uh, self-sufficient, um, the, the more self-sufficient we are, the better our chances will be. Well, thank you, David. You know, you say you've realized now in retrospect that a lot of your activism was misdirected, but that is where it should work. Like governments, our democratic systems should be working. So. No one can blame you, like we needed to try that. And nevertheless, thank you for all the work that you've done. Oh, well. Thank you for inspiring and educating everyone. And thank you for taking on government shit fuckery, which is why <laughs> I also have a, a little uh, gift for you. Um, this is one of our, um, our t-shirts um, uh. from the Department of Shit Fuckery <laughs> with our um, logo. And it's the, the only one that we've printed in, in green, which uh, <laughs> matches your shirt and I, uh, it, it, I in your it. honor. So I love it. Something to add to your um, I collection. I love it. That's <laughs> great.
Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Juice Media Podcast. I hope you found something in it that speaks to you during this crazy chapter of history that we're living through. You may have noticed lately that I've been making fewer episodes of the Juice Media Podcast. In fact, I haven't made an episode for months and I really miss it. The simple reason for this is that in between making Honest Government ads this year, I've been making an effort to spend a bit more quality time with our kids, Luca and Juno. Cheers. Cheers. Who are still at that precious age where they love nothing more than hanging out with their parents. You know, before they grow up. I'll keep making this video podcast series during this period. But after three years of consistently making a podcast after every Honest Government ad, I'll be making it a bit more sporadically, on special occasions, like this one. And don't worry, we'll still keep making regular monthly Honest Government ads, which are the bread and butter of this channel. And we have many topics to cover both here at home and abroad. As always, thank you to all our patrons out there who make the Honest Government ads and the Juice Media podcast possible, especially our patron producers who are the backbone of the Juice Media. Thank you. If you'd like to help us keep governments honest and can comfortably afford to, you can do so. Patreon.com forward slash the Juice Media. You've been listening to the Juice Media Podcast with me, Giordano. I'll catch you very soon for our next Honest Government ad. Till then, take care. Now please rise for our national anthem. Just out for a rip, are you what? Just out for a rip. As you know, we're experiencing... <laughs> yeah!